He had just settled this point with great composure when the entrance of Mrs. John Dashwood put an end to the subject. But though she never spoke of it out of her own family, Eleanor could see its influence on her mind, in the something like confusion of countenance with which she entered, and an attempt at cordiality in her behavior to herself. She even proceeded so far as to be concerned to find that Eleanor and her sister were so soon to leave town as she had hoped to see more of them, an exertion in which her husband, who attended her into the room and hung enamored over her accents, seemed to distinguish everything that was most affectionate and graceful. Boom! That's how we do. Hey, you with the earbuds, who was just killing it with Chapter 41? Did I make Jane Austen my girlfriend or what? Uh, uh, are you speaking to me? No, I'm speaking to Zeppo, the forgotten Bronte sister. Yeah, I'm speaking to you. It's just that I've listened to a lot of audiobooks, and this is the first time the reader spoke directly to me. You bet I'm speaking directly to you, chump wagon. So who's got it going on, huh? Um, you do? You bet I do. Listen to me kick it. But she must not go round by London, cried Marianne in the same hurried manner. I shall never see her if she goes by London. That's what I'm talking about. Mm. It's just that I don't think audiobook readers are supposed to be so intrusive. Old school. Do you want to hear some more Virginia Woolf? How about a little Louisa May Alcott? Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents, grumbled Joe, lying on the rug. Forget about it. I don't think that's the proper way to read that book. And anyway, no, I don't want to hear other writers. I want you to read Sense and Sensibility all the way through with no more of this nonsense. I was just trying to make literature come alive for you, sir. I'm really sorry. I I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. You just got punked. I told you I'm a great emoter. Look, I'm bored with Jane Austen. I'm going to switch over to Jurassic Park. The rest of you listen to this show on audiobooks. And now the equivalent of Snoop Dogg reading Bridges of Madison County, Colin McEnroe. You know, I think actually I would like to hear some Snoop Dogg read Bridges of Madison County. In fact, that might be the only way I would be comfortable at this point engaging with the Bridges of, Bridges of Madison County would be if Snoop Dogg were to read it to me. So I've become, as I've said, a fan of audiobooks over the last year or so. I've started really to kind of adding them to my life, and I've become increasingly fascinated by the medium itself. It's got its own tropes and rules and motifs and conventions, uh, and it, it has stars, too. There are people who read who are already famous, but there are other people, and I think I first noticed this. I was listening to the, the Slate Culture Gab Fest, and they started effusing over a particular reader. I, I now no longer remember who it was, but they were saying, oh, well, it's read by this guy, you know, and we love it when he reads books. And I was thinking, Really? These people that you've never heard of before are really famous because of the way they read books. But now I get it. I totally get it. Uh, And so we wanted to do a show about this world. As we go along, I'm going to make uh, maybe even more of it than uh, than my typical imprecation to you because we'd love to hear from you about your experiences uh, with audiobooks. Uh, Our number, 860-275-7266. Have you had wonderful experiences? Do you refuse to even try it? Uh, Are you somewhere in between? Can you do nonfiction but not fiction? All that kind of stuff. 860-275-7266. You may also tweet right at us, at WNPR Colin. Let me tell you who's here. Uh, Hilary Urich is in studio with me. She's director of production at Tentor Media in Old Saybrook. Who knew? But right down Route 9, uh, there turns out to be a place where they actually do make these uh, audio books. Uh, and uh, joining me by phone right now is Michelle Cobb, publisher of Audiophile Magazine and executive director of the Audio Publishers Association. A little bit later, we're having a little bit of a technical stress. There. Oh, no, we're good. That, that, that all actually works now. So a little bit later, you're going to meet uh, William Demerit, uh, an actor, writer, and audiobook narrator who I have actually been effusing about on other shows because of the amazing uh, job he did with uh, Ben Winter's book, Under, Underground Airlines. Uh, so you'll you'll hear. I mean, really, this guy, it's a tour de force. Uh, also, Tavia Gilbert, a performer, writer, producer, and audiobook narrator. narrator. A lot of audiobooks uh, under her belt. You're going to meet them a little bit later in the show. I want to start with Michelle uh, and Hillary uh, to begin with and talk about the genre itself. So, um, uh, Michelle Cobb, I'm going to begin with you. I mean, every year there turn out even to be awards that are given out uh, for a best audio book, uh, audio awards and things like that. So, so how, 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 what's a good audio book? What makes a good audio book as opposed to simply, you know, the book that wins the Pulitzer Prize or the book that wins the National Book Award? What, what makes a, a top-notch audio book? Well, I always say it's the marriage of the text itself, the content of the book, and the narrator. When you bring 
a wonderful book and wonderful narration together, you really get to a different kind of experience. And you're bringing the text to yourself in a whole new way, getting the pacing, the interpretation, and the narrator almost steps out of it. You don't really notice them. You just become really embroiled in the story that's being told to you. Of course, storytelling in the oral format is the original storytelling. So we really brought back to something that's part of history, and we can really love a book in a whole new way. Um, And, you know, Hillary, what I'm wondering also is when you – uh, we'll maybe a little bit later in the show talk about how a project like this comes to be. But when you start reading a book that you know or think you are going to produce as an audio book, do you start start thinking about voices like, hmm, I wonder who would be good for this? I'm doing my impersonation of you. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, I always like to think that the mind of a casting director is pretty crowded. Mm-hmm. And so when you start to read a book and you're looking at the prose, you're looking at how it's structured – you have so many familiar voices that you've heard in other pieces or maybe a voice that you've heard in another genre, but you want to break into another genre. You want to imagine what they sound like in another book. Um, it's a really great creative process. And absolutely, people come to mind immediately when you start reading a book and read, thinking they would be amazing at this. They can really connect with it. Because one of the things that you can tell right away is if a narrator is not connecting with a title or if they really are connecting and really transporting the listener. Wait a minute. What if they're not connecting and you've already got them in the studio? What do you do? Oh. <laughs> Say, go home? You're, you, we picked the wrong person? Well, auditions are good and yeah. also a lot of research. So it's one of the main points of casting to really do your research to make sure someone can really handle that and to make the right choice. So a certain percentage of our listening audience has never heard an audio book. So let's pick a really popular one. Uh, this is a, a Paul Hawkins' book, uh, Girl on a Train. Um, you probably have heard about that one. Uh, it's narrated by Claire Corbett, uh, Louise Brealey, uh, and India Fisher. Let's hear a little bit of that. Of course she misses him, just as I do. He's kind and strong, everything a husband should be. And they are a partnership. I can see it. I know how they are. His strength, that protectiveness he radiates, it doesn't mean she's weak. She's strong in other ways. She makes intellectual leaps that leave him open-mouthed in admiration. She can cut to the nub of a problem, dissect and analyse it in the time it takes other people to say good morning. At parties, he often holds her hand, even though they've been together years. They respect each other. They don't put each other down. I feel exhausted this evening. I am sober, stone cold. Some days I feel so bad that I have to drink. Some days I feel so bad that I can't. Today, the thought of alcohol turns my stomach. But sobriety on the evening train is a challenge, particularly now, in this heat. A film of sweat covers every inch of my skin. The inside of my mouth prickles. My eyes itch. Mascara rubbed into their corners. My phone buzzes in my handbag, making me jump. Two girls sitting across the carriage look at me and then at each other with a sly exchange of smiles. I don't know what they think of me, but I know it isn't good. That actually was the 2016 audio, um, excuse me, Audi Award uh, winner, uh, the Paul Hawkins hit novel, uh, The Girl on a Train. So, Michelle Cobb, um, one of the things that I alluded to in introducing this clip is the notion of having uh, more than one narrator. Uh, lately, I've uh, been listening to some audio books that maybe have three narrators. Is that a trend? Uh, is that something? I mean, I used I had very few encounters with audiobooks, say, 10 or 15 years ago when they were mostly on CDs. I don't remember multiple narrators. Well, it's something in the tradition of radio dramas. So you can have two different types. You can have something like Girl on the Train or The Help, which has different characters' uh, perspectives from different chapters, and so different narrators read those chapters. Or you can have more of a dramatized version where you have people interacting via the text like you would hear in a radio drama or a play. And we're, we're seeing more and more of those multicast performances, either with or without interaction. And again, it's, it's providing a little bit of a different experience that you, than you get from single-voiced narration. But yes, we are seeing more of this. Um, occasionally, um, Hillary, there are, I think World War Z, they did it this way. There were like 20 narrators. Uh, at a certain point, does that feel to you like it's sort of not a book anymore, that it's, it's something else is going on there? Um, 
I think there are two different schools of thought on that. I mean, some people interpret it as you know listening to an experience, more of a media production, or you know listening to the book. I don't really think there's really much of a difference for me personally. I would still consider it an audio book at that point. It's just different points of view telling the story. Sometimes you do have the you know, true 20 points of view that you do want properly represented if it's appropriate for the production. I mean, Michelle, the most common thing to do is sort of exactly what Hillary's talking about, which is, you know, for example, Fates and Furies is probably a pretty good example from recent years. There are two distinct narrators. It's a husband and wife telling the story of their marriage from their own perspectives. I mean, it really did make sense there to have a male and female narrator. Yes, and it's a lot easier to record something by chapter via a single perspective. When you're trying to bring together through editing or in the studio a lot of different voices, it's a lot more time put into the production. And sometimes, especially with how much simultaneous release we have, you don't actually have time between getting the text and producing the audio book to bring in 20 narrators and have them in a studio together or to record them separately and cut them all together. Um, We're getting a lot of calls here about this. I want to grab uh, one. We'd love to hear your experiences uh, about audiobooks. I will say, I don't know if this is the most common (laughs) use of them because I'm starting to use them lots of different ways. But certainly, you know, with a drive from here to Montreal or something, it's great to have an audiobook in the car. Unless you and your significant other need to talk some things out. Uh, Here's uh, Helena in Canton, or Helena perhaps. Hi, you're on the air. In which way do you say your name? Helena. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what's on your mind? Um, no, uh, I I really love audiobooks. Um, I enjoy reading um, just in general, but I really, really love listening to spoken word. And um, what I've really enjoyed about audiobooks is sort of your ability to listen to them with someone and have it be a shared experience versus reading and talking about it. Um, every summer, my mom and I would uh, rent this book called Dog Friday from the public library, and we'd listen to it. And what was really cool was it was read by this guy named Nigel Lambert. And he was super funny, and the book was super funny, and the combination was just absolutely hilarious. So my mom and I would get it every summer, and it would be super fun, and we ended up naming our dog. We got a dog and named him Friday after the book. Um, So for us, it was like a big, meaningful thing that we did every year. And the story takes place in the summertime. So for us, it was we were able to sort of share this. And uh, it's a British book, and I eventually we wore out the Sims Ray Public Library's copy of it. And so I went to London um, in college and ended up, ended up getting her the CD when I was in college. So now she has a copy of it. Uh, you were the one who wore it out. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, um, Hillary, she's making a point that I think that I, I guess in, I was unintentionally making uh, leading into that, too, which is, you know, you and I could probably read separate copies of the same book and maybe once in a while turn to each other and go, what page are you on now? Or something like that. But this is really the way that you can share a book with another person. I mean, on a long drive, if, you know, if you've got it on in the car, it really more than one person can be experiencing the book at the same time. I guess I'm saying something really obvious, but it's a real advantage of audiobooks. Oh, it absolutely is. And it's something that you can, with today's technology, especially with the digital medium, you could really go, okay, well, you know, one minute and 47 seconds into this. you got to listen to this. It's really sticking in my mind. What do you think about it? And it's something that you can share across you know, many people and have that discussion and really get transported by whatever you're hearing with the performance. Um, you know, Michelle Cobb, I've published three books with major publishing houses, and none of them have been particularly successful, uh, and nor has anyone uh, clamored for the audiobook version of it, including my publishers. So uh, do authors sometimes take matters into their own hands and just decide, well, you know what? I really think there needs to be an audio version of this book. Absolutely. We see this happening more and more, and they have options. They can produce themselves with a production studio like Dion Audio in Los Angeles or John Marshall Media in New York, or they can go into Audible's audiobook creation exchange and find a producer and a narrator there. Uh, They can record it themselves. There's a whole host of options, both for production and for distribution now. Uh, Hillary, does that happen with, uh, I don't know by what route books travel to get to to Tantor. How how do you wind up with somebody? Is is it ever author-generated? Um, it sometimes is. We have some self-published authors. We also go through agencies. We go through uh, standard publishers. We have a really great acquisitions team who has a really great um, research capability, and they try to find the best talent, however you know, methods they can. We get some really great authors in, either directly or indirectly. So, um, Michelle, you were kind of alluding to this at the beginning of the conversation, but I want to know more. Um, are, are there uh, Is this landscape changing all the time? I mean, is an audiobook 
three or four or five years from now likely to be different from what it is now in terms of more bells and whistles? Uh, or I, I'm just I'm just curious to know how is the form changing? Well, really, over the, over the past five years, the technology has changed things. We record digitally now. People can record in their homes as opposed to just being in the studio. And we can send not only the book files but the audio files back and forth through the Internet a lot quicker than we used to do it, which was through FedEx. So that's really changed our ability as an industry to produce more, to be more efficient. And between 2011 and 2015, we went from recording about 7,000 audiobooks per year as an industry to recording almost 36,000 per year. So you've seen a growth in sales, you've seen a growth in the number of titles being produced, and some of that is due to the technologies. You know, where it will take us in the future, I think is hard to say. The, you know, the world is our oyster. As more people become aware of the format and want more titles in the format, I think we're trying more and different things as an industry, which is really fun to be a part of. Oh, one of the trends, and I guess this is probably old news to you, but I'm just uh, figuring out all this stuff. But there's something called WhisperSync, right, which allows you basically to toggle back yeah. and forth between audio and ebook. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that Audible has put together, and we're seeing more of those synced text and audio type products through apps. Uh, through some streaming services that have come out. So we're starting to see people be able to go back and forth, and regardless of whether they're in the car or in their house, they can be taking in that material in the way that works best for them at that very moment. And that initially had no appeal to me. Right now I happen to be in the middle of Michael Chabon's Yiddish Policeman's Union, and I feel like there are things that are slipping by me because I'm not picking up the Yiddish word or I want to know the spelling of it or something like that. Now I'm saying my kingdom for some whisper sync. Um, (laughs) So, um, Hillary, in terms of what Tantor does, well, first of all, maybe we can just talk about the difference between the stuff that you buy digitally and you sort of never have contact with any physical object uh, and and what used to be uh, and still in some cases is uh, our notion of the audio book where you get a CD or you get something in a box. Um, is, there a, um, is there still a market, first of all, that, for that second kind of thing? Well, absolutely, um, especially for libraries. Retail and library have had good good sales numbers, and they are doing pretty well. A lot of people do prefer to have something in their hand. They like to have the actual product. They like to turn it over, look at the back cover, look at the spine, look at the cover itself. Um, It's a very tangible experience. So there's two different kinds of audiences. A lot of people do prefer to get things digitally where they can still see, you know, the beautiful cover that's been created or, you know, and just go through the tracks. You know, I'm... (laughs) This is an embarrassing admission, but because, okay, so I listened to to a book from Audible uh, before this one, and you have so little engagement with the physical book. I mean, there is no physical book. All there is is a little thing on your screen that you're looking at mm-hmm. that I— <laughs> I couldn't, for one, I 100 percent sure tell you for sure that I know the title of the book. I know the author of the book, and I'm pretty sure it was called The Longest Night. But it's kind of like you know, if you're holding a book all the time and picking it up and all this, you know, I mean, you know a lot of things about it. It's sort of weird, but a physical object does communicate with you in all kinds of ways besides the digital one. To me, sometimes a book that's on my phone, it's just that book I'm listening to right now. I can see where you're coming from there. I think it's people adapt to things differently, and I'm kind of I. I've I've grown with the industry sort of I've been seeing it change and for me I also listen to a lot of digital music so I've tried to I've to become a uh, accommodated to you know looking at the cover associating it with where it is in my you know music library and I think for audiobooks it's sort of the same. Let's grab a few. We got a lot of calls. People really want to talk about this stuff. Rita, if you can just hang on because it's you, you're going to set up something for uh, Michelle really well in just a second. But Mike from New London, uh, what do you have to say? Hey, thanks for having me on. Um, I've been an audio uh, listener for years and years and years. I think I was one of the first 1,000 Audible.com customers. But my point is that human, you know, audio books, um, it's the most natural way of learning. I mean, we, the oral history for 99.9% of human history, it has been an oral history. This idea of writing it down and reading it is a very modern uh, modern invention. I know. I sometimes, so, I sometimes wonder if, like, you know, people were listening to Virgil and then they go, wait a minute, I wasn't paying attention a couple of seconds ago. Could you go back and do that again? And it must have been kind of frustrating in some ways. Yeah, and, and, but I've, uh, I've, I just love uh, audiobooks. I've been a real fanatic for them. 
All right. Well, listen, so. thanks for your call. It's a great point. I mean, it's kind of how we did absorb. I, I think uh, Michelle and Hillary were making that same point early on, that we are sort of naturally wired to do things that way. Here's uh, Michael from Windsor. Hi, Michael. Oh, Michael just hung up. But he was, uh, you know, he's asking a question anyway, he was going to ask a question that I now want to ask you guys anyway. I'll ask both of you, although, Hillary, you can say even more about it in, in some of the other segments. But um, but I'll ask you and, and both Michelle. Like, so... Uh, in Michelle's publication, there's whole, this whole segment called Golden Voices, you know, and, and it, it goes back to the thing I was saying at the beginning of the show. There's some people who, you know, I mean, everybody knows who Garrison Keillor is, but then there are other people who have emerged as stars of this world. What, what do you think m- makes them stars? What do you think makes a great narrator? Um, probably uh, talent first and foremost. When someone believes in you, when someone new comes onto the scene where they're sending in auditions and you suddenly – you start listening to them and you hear them start to um, become the voice in your head. That's the most special part of casting, especially when you get a new voice and you can see them doing something and you want to give them the chance to do it. And they could be doing that with five or six different publishers and they get their foot in, they get their exposure and they become very diverse in what they're recording. And that's so key. But a lot of it is also luck with being paired with a really great book, a really great author. Um, Michelle, what do you think? Who, who gets to be those golden voices? What do they have in common? They can all connect with the text really well, and they all have an ability to bring characters to life in new and interesting ways. And you're doing this with just you and a microphone and having to be very still, and they have an amazing talent to drag the listener in uh, and really transport them. I, I think also, you know, to to Hillary's point, too, you know, it can be sort of hit or miss. I mean, there really are three parties involved here. The person who created the text in the first place, the reader who's uh, extracting certain things from the text, and, and then the narrator, the the, the reader, uh, the, I mean, the reader, I should separate the reader from the narrator. Um, and for me, for example, uh, reading The Sellout, I'm sure if William Demerit, who's about to come on pretty soon, had been the reader on The Sellout, I absolutely could have had his brain set, his voice set up in my brain as the narrator of that book. It would have worked great. I just, there was nothing wrong with the guy who was narrating that book. It just didn't work for me. It's so idiosyncratic. There's just, uh, me, particularly with a first person narration, I think, you know, either you buy that person as the narr- narrator or you don't. And it just seems like. You know, it it can be a little bit hit or miss. But to that point, um, Michelle, are, are there is there sort of are there canonical books here, audio books that just really sort of leap out as as great examples of the genre? Oh, absolutely. And, and that's one of the reasons why Audiophile Magazine's Best of the Year exists, to help pull out those best performances each year. You know, some that leap to mind, obviously, Harry Potter. You know, Jim Dale did the version that was released here in the U.S. and Stephen Fry in the U.K. And both of those are, you know, just the pinnacle of great audiobook narration. Uh, and things like The Golden Compass, the Philip Pullman books mm-hmm. with the multi-voiced performances. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, of course, one of my personal favorites, which is a nonfiction, is Tina Fey reading her own autobiography, Bossy Pants. All right. Let's actually back up for a second. I, we just want to hear a little bit of uh, you talked about Jim Dale and Stephen Fry, uh, the two different readers, depending on uh, what country you live in, of Harry Potter. This is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. We'll just hear a little bit of it uh, read by Jim Dale. The two men appeared out of nowhere, a few yards apart in the narrow, moonlit lane. For a second, they stood quite still, wands directed at each other's chests. Then, recognizing each other, they stowed their wands beneath their cloaks and started walking briskly in the same direction. News? asked the taller of the two. The best, replied Severus Snape. The lane was bordered on the left by wild, low-growing brambles. All right. And then as we begin to uh, conclude this segment, uh, and thank you very much, Michelle Cobb, for all the guidance that you've given us uh, during this segment. We're, we're going to hear uh, what Michelle says is one of our other big favorites from the world of nonfiction. This, of course, is the writer who's also a talented performer uh, reading her own work. This is Tina Fey with a little bit of bossy pants. Welcome, friend. Congratulations on your purchase of this American-made genuine audiobook. Each component of this audiobook was selected to provide you with maximum audio performance, whatever your listening needs may be. If you're a woman and you bought this audiobook for practical tips on how to make it in a male-dominated workplace, here they are. No pigtails, no tube tops, cry sparingly. 
Some people say, never let them see you cry. I say, if you're so mad you could just cry, then cry. It terrifies everyone. When choosing sexual partners, remember, talent is not sexually transmittable. Also, don't eat diet foods in meetings. Perhaps you're a parent and you bought this audiobook to learn how to raise an achievement-oriented, drug-free adult virgin. You'll find that, too. The essential ingredients, I can tell you up front, are a strong father figure, bad skin, and a child-sized colonial lady outfit. Maybe you bought this book because you love Sarah Palin and you want to find reasons to hate me. We've got that. I use all kinds of elitist words like impervious and gerund, and I think gay people are just as good at watching their kids play hockey as straight people. We're talking about audiobooks today. We welcome your calls, by the way, 860-275-7266. In the studio with me is Hilary Urich, Director of Production at Tantor Media in Old Saybrook, where they make audiobooks. Uh, and um, and now, I, let me just preface this by saying that occasionally in idle moments of my life over the last 15 years, I, I would say to myself, eh, I, I talk into a mic. Maybe I should probably do one of those audiobooks. I bet I could narrate an audiobook. And then I started listening to them. I realized it's so much harder than I thought it was. You, you need so many more skills than I actually have. Uh, and so we're going to talk to the people who actually do have those skills. Uh, William Demerit is joining us. Uh, you've heard me a fuse about him. He's an actor, writer, and audiobook narrator. Uh, I've been listening to him uh, do uh, Ben Winters' book. And Ben Winters was recently on the show, also raving about William Demerit. Uh, Tavia Gilbert is a performer, writer, producer, and audiobook narrator. So, uh, Tavia, I'm going to have you kick things off for us. Um, what's the difference between being an actor and being an audiobook narrator or reader? Is this just acting in a different way, or are you actually utilizing a different skill set? There is no difference. So one of my most um, detested questions that people <laughs> offer unintentionally I hope I just is, didn't ask it. No, not at all, not at all. But people say, are you also an actor? And I, my response is always yes. Every time I sit down behind the mic, I am drawing on all of the skills that I would draw on for theater, for an on-camera gig. Um, it's the same thing. So the the mission of every actor in any role they ever approach in any medium is to be uh, a medium for an experience that the audience has. We take a piece of writing, whether it's a play or a script or a book, and we translate that into an experience for someone else. So it's all the same stuff. You draw on different um, tools in your toolbox as, box as an actor to perform a certain genre, but it's all acting and it's all emotional accessibility. William Demerit, I would assume that one uh, difference between this and other kinds of acting is, unless you're Alan Cumming and you're doing like Olive Macbeth all by yourself out, out there on stage, you usually don't get to do the whole thing. When you do an audio book, and particularly a solo narrator audio book, you're the whole show. Oh, Colin, I don't know about that, because the difference is... Um, uh, first, I, I just have to thank you for... Um, your effusiveness and uh, Jonathan, your producer, for getting me on here, and, and Michelle <laughs> that you had earlier. You all have been very, very kind to me, so thank you. Um, and yes, the difference is is that unless you're Alan Cumming, um, I actually just did a one man show that I wrote live, like a theater piece. You don't usually get to tell the whole story. And as an actor, um, I'm in the business of storytelling, and it's great to do a play, and it's wonderful to do a film or a TV show, but especially in that instance, you're only acting in a sort of piecemeal sense. This is the first um, time I've ever, ever heard your real voice, I just realized. I mean, oh. I've, heard, I've heard you I heard you do 16 different characters uh, in the Winter's novel. I didn't really know what you actually sounded like when you were you were just being yourself. Well, so, this, this is a version of me. I've been told that uh, my voice changes depending on to whom I am speaking and the time of day and sometimes what food I'm eating. But uh, I think this is more or less me. So, Hillary, maybe you can give us a sense. What's the audition uh, process like? I mean, I... Does, do people like William come in and, and uh, Tavia and go, I really need this job? <laughs> you know, well, or do you, just, do, do you just get actual digital samples of what they sound like? Um, it, both. Um, we've had people come into our studio, actually. We record a lot of uh, titles out of our studio in Connecticut. But we also do a lot of our work at Tantor remotely. So when looking to book a narrator, we'll ask for sometimes a custom sample, which is either from the text itself or from a similar text. Um, and a lot of the times... Just looking up a narrator's work in a particular genre or by another author online is often enough to get a good grip on what they can do with that book. 
So uh, w- one of the things that I've been wondering, and I'm something of a newbie to listening to audiobooks, and actually, William, you're a little bit of a newbie to narrating yes, I am. audiobooks. Um, so I'm going to start, first of all, with Tavia. I started wondering, are there certain kind of vocal tropes and conventions that you you have to master if you're going to be good at this? I mean, I, I haven't heard you read a whole book yet, but I've heard a bunch of female narrators, a lot of female narrators, are reading books. And, for example, when they have to do the male voice, there's a kind of thing that they do that sounds like it's the same identical vocal thing, like their vocal folds are, are always doing the same thing. Is, is there sort of a, are there certain things you kind of have to learn how to do if you're going to do this? Well, I think you do have to learn a specific technique, and it does not have anything, virtually anything to do with the sound of your voice. So people will say, I have a nice voice. People have told me I have a great voice. I can do it. Well, sure, there are s- specific techniques that we need to have. And Yes, a big part of that, I think, um, is having the ability to differentiate character and gender. So uh, everybody approaches their work with their own style Mm. and will bring their particular shades um, to the palette of the book that they're working with. But um, we do have to differentiate ourselves and women play men, men play women. Um, and the the point is always to make it um, sound authentic. I want my dialogue to sound like real people in conversation. I want my men to sound like men. And whether I approach that by becoming slightly lower in my register but not doing a lot, or if I just really want to change, you know, really make a character voice, you know, that's a shade of color um, slight adjustment to a big adjustment and I need to match what that book calls for, what that character needs and make sure that the choices I'm making are supporting the best intentions of that author. Uh, I was prior to this, I was I was thinking, how could I possibly goad Tavia into doing some of her male voices for me? Uh, problem solved without my help. So, um, William, one of the things that you have to do uh, in Underground Airlines is um, do a lot of dialects, a lot of different dialects. Your um, your primary narrator is a guy who's uh, he's part of the secret kind of well, horrible U.S. Marshal program uh, that that catches runaway slaves, but runaway slaves in the present day. But then there's sort of I mean, for starters, just a lot of other different black dialects. And there's one where th- there's some you know kind of young toughs uh, who who attempt to menace uh, this narrator uh, completely unaware of who they're dealing with. And so, I don't know, is this a problem that you instinctually solve? Like, how's that person going to sound? How's this person going to sound? Do you do you go to school on it? I mean, how do you solve those problems? Oh, boy, so many answers. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, accents have kind of always been a thing for me, and then after grad school, it, it became a professional thing because we learned how to do it technically, not just in sort of an aural feedback way, but in terms of <clears throat> what structurally changes in your mouth, what articulators you're using, resonance, and that sort of thing. Um, that was all very technical. <laughs> um, and and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dork for that stuff anyway. But in terms of solving the problem, I... I I'm still figuring it out because you'll have five or six main characters and I'll really hammer out what I think those voices will be. And then I'll get in the booth and I'll work with the the producer or the director or the sound engineer and they'll they'll say, okay, that works, that doesn't work, try this, change that. But then you get to these other characters who sort of just pop up for a page or two or a line or two and you're like, oh, it's another southern dialect of another – guy in his 20s or 30s who's of a similar build and what can I do to kind of fudge it and sometimes it's just an issue of you know taking your pitch up a little bit or maybe he you know has a funny way that he says his s's or he talks quieter um but I sort of have the pillar like the character pillars of the five or six whoever they are and then I I kind of finesse everything else so I do this horrible, dangerous thing, which I really oh. do not encourage other people to do, but sometimes Great. I do listen to audiobooks while I'm out riding my bike. I can actually oh. – I, I have the earbuds so I can hear oncoming traffic and stuff like that, and I try not to get too distracted. But occasionally, listening to you, I would just stop my bike and go, holy crap. Uh, there's, there's this one character. He's not around for very long, and I won't make you do him unless you want to do him. But he's like this 99-year-old white guy who's – you know, kind of both clueless and also incredibly helpful uh, to the <laughs> Underground Railroad. And, I, you know, and like, a- after hearing all the voices that you did, when you did that guy, I actually stopped my bike and thought, 
how in the world did he just do that? Thanks. I know. Can, I, can you do that guy? I really enjoy doing it. I, I don't think I can find his voice now because I don't remember. I haven't I haven't heard it, but I know that he was Southern. And then I think I aged myself up a bit, but I don't know if that was it. I mean, it was something like that. Yeah, I probably had like to be that. in the moment for that one. I yeah. should say we're also, Tavia Gilbert has a huge fan base, which is now tweeting. You, so you're nodding. You know that. How do you know oh. that, Hillary? Oh, Tavia is one of the most wonderful, wonderful people to work with. I've been working with her for years, and it's always a joy. She's so, the, the top-notch so professional. So your yeah your people are all tweeting at us uh, right now, Tavia. Tavia, do you ever like look at a text and go, "Nah, I just don't think I'm the right person. I don't think I can do that." Um, occasionally, although I really trust the casting directors I work with, and I work for virtually every publisher, which is a really great uh, gift. Um, I trust that they're casting me thoughtfully, and they want me for a certain book for a certain reason. So, no, I mean I think that people cast. Um, for the best quality production. Sometimes I uh, have pushed back. I did play a 50-year-old man in a first-person book and and pushed back a bit and said, I don't think I'm the right voice for this, but um, they thought that I was for various reasons, and then it got a great review, so I was quite relieved. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let's grab a call here from Leslie in New Haven. We have a lot of calls for this show. Hi, Leslie. You're on the air. Hi. Um, Well, I was calling for two things. One, because I had also agreed... um, that I found actors to be really good um, readers for these books. I listen to them a lot. And one of the other things that I found is that I'm usually listening to audiobooks when I'm doing something else, like driving or trying to paint my house. And I've, I've really loved comedies or pretty theatrical kind of readings. So um, I really loved Fisher Stevens and A Dirty Job, and I, I loved... Um, the Nancy Boys, Lenny Henry, that was great. But then I've also found where I've thought, well, I'll listen to something more serious. So I tried to listen to The Sound and the Fury, and I nearly wrecked my car. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Who is that? Which one was that? So I sometimes think that these really deep books don't always, you know, you kind of want to sit with those and read back what someone's saying and hear the voices and think about it. But I really love the animation of an actor reading it a good book that, that I can get into at any moment. And also, I don't know if you heard, John Waters did a really great job of role models. That was a pretty awesome author read as well. Caddy doesn't smell like trees anymore. <laughs> um, so um, I, I, I have a bunch of thoughts and questions about this, but one of the things that, that I've, uh, I've thought is, and, and maybe both of you can talk about this, is that, uh, and Tavia, I'll ask you first, you know, to her point about um, books that are funny, uh, by the way, Fisher Stevens can now be seen selling Viagra on the night of. Um, I thought that but, was him. Yeah, that is him. Yeah. So um, the, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like b- because humor is rhythmic, you know, it, it has cadence, it has beats. Sometimes I feel like I- I'll I'll laugh at something that I might have not noticed to laugh if I were reading the printed version, just because a voice can bring a rhythm alive. Absolutely, and I think, you know, we read often much more quickly than we listen. And hearing a story told for you in real time offers a rich experience that reading on the page does not. Reading on the page offers a different experience, obviously in its own right. I'm a reader of print still and love it. But I love performing humor because it is about finding the punchline, getting the timing just right. And having the chance to do a book that requires um, a really fine comedic sense of timing is just a pleasure. I love it. Um, I'm William. I'll, I'll ask you the same question uh, once again. Uh, you know, Underground Airlines, although it has some pretty grim, a lot of pretty grim material in it, it's also it's a fabulously entertaining book. And there are some some laughs in some places that you can milk it for comic material. Although I suppose one question you would have, and I don't know whether you go back and forth with, with Ben Winters about this, is well, is this line at all funny? Do do you consult with the author about that, or are you guys? Um, you know, I, I haven't had a lot of opportunity to consult with the authors during the process sometimes towards the end of the process or or afterwards i'll kind of get feedback from them but but usually it's just uh the people in the booth with me which uh tommy heron was my producer at uh hachette publishing for underground airlines and he was a fantastic director um so you know i i would sit and read the thing and tommy would say oh you know, maybe it's this, or I'd get to the line and I'd say, hey, is this is this a joke? And you do a few different reads. But, I mean, you know, as Tavia was saying, humor, as a writer, and I'm sure she and I would both speak to this, right, there's a certain way 
that a joke is written for the page and there's a certain way that a joke is written to be spoken and with most of these books the author's intention was not necessarily to have an audiobook it was to have a printed book and maybe the audiobook was a a secondary thought um so it, it is it's fun and sometimes difficult but you know you find the joke and hopefully you have someone to help you find it um, Hillary, uh, we, we have to end this section segment pretty soon, and we're going to end with um, some of uh, Tavia uh, reading a book. But before we do that, I'm curious, in general, do authors want to sit on these little eggs of these audiobooks? Do they want to be hanging around the studio, or do they want to not go near it? Um, actually, we've had a, quite a few author recordings, and actually one of the listeners, uh, one of the callers had mentioned John Waters. We had John Waters, actually, in our Connecticut studio recording um, a couple of years ago. It was a lot of fun. Um we do get quite a few. A lot of it is memoir based. Mm-hmm. People want to really represent what their story was. We do get some fiction. And do, and do they ever want to hover over the William Demerits and Tavia Gilberts and go, oh, no, no, don't read it that way? <laughs> I mean, I assume you don't want them around when that's happening. No, um, we do connect people by email usually or by phone if they do want to connect, but it's not always necessary. All right, uh, let's uh, end this segment with uh, Tavia reading. I'm not even sure I know how to pronounce the name of this book, Tavia. Is it La Divine or La Divine? It's La Divine. La Divine. It's a Let's French a translation. Oh, La Divine. Okay, I got La it now. Divine. All right, so uh, here's Tavia Gilbert with a little bit of that, and then we'll come back. She had no opinion on the matter, no emotion, only the stubborn, immovable, almost innate conviction that it was her twofold responsibility to act and to keep it a secret. And when, arriving in Bordeaux, she set off on foot for the Saint-Croix neighborhood, always sticking to the same streets and the same sides of those streets, it was less the obligation of secrecy than her self-imposed duty never to weaken that kept her from taking a taxi, or later the tram, where some regular might someday spot her, speak to her, ask where she was headed, which Clarisse Riviere, who in this city was Malinka in spirit and incapable of falsehood, would have answered with nothing other than the truth. I'm going to see my mother, she would have said. That she might have to speak such a sentence was unthinkable. Today's show was read by Stephen King and produced by Jonathan McPants and me, Kyone Wolf, with technical help from Betsy Kaplan. Greg Hill tweets for us at WNPR Colin and appeared in the intro. The part of Bill Curry was played by John Irving. You can subscribe to The Colin McEnroe Show on iTunes, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And check out our Colin McEnroe Show Facebook page. On tomorrow's show, our salute to the sun. And now, back to Colin. Yeah, we're going to talk about the sun and all of its manifestations, uh, both from uh, both astronomy and symbolism, and anthropology and stuff. Anyway. We're talking about audiobooks right now. We have uh, a great uh, panel to talk about it. Um, I should have uh, mentioned also that uh, Tavia Gilbert, whom you just heard, is an audiophile earphones award winner. I don't know exactly what that is, but it sounds very impressive. <laughs> uh, well, this should seem, I feel like it should be earbuds. Oh, well, <laughs> anyway. mm-hmm. um, so, know. yeah, but it, whatever. It's an award, right? It's, that's a good, that's it the is. important that, that particular title, La Divine, just won that award. So I have many of those awards, but that title was <laughs> right. acclaimed, which is great. Okay, that is uh, great. So uh, we also want you to hear a, a little bit of William. Uh, this is from Underground Airlines, a book uh, that I, I mean, either read the book as a book or get the audio book, which is what I did. You'll have a great time uh, either way. And I believe it's also an audiophile earphones award winner. You guys just, you're going to piling up the trophies. Uh, Thank there. you. Well, uh, as, but here's a little bit of uh, William uh, doing Underground Airlines. A hotel man came in, khaki pants and polo shirt, treading silently enough on the thick carpeting to escape the girl's attention, although I, a great noticer of small sounds, heard him fine. He waited, watching, arms folded across his chest as the girl helped herself to one of the paper cups stacked beside the coffee machine and began to fill it with the two percent milk meant for cereal. Miss, he said suddenly, loudly, may I help you? What? The woman turned quickly, jerked the paper cup from the milk dispenser, sloshed some over the sides. No, no, you're fine, I'm good, thanks. The hotel man walked over to her, brisk and self-important in his slacks and magenta shirt with Crossroads Hotel sewn on the breast pocket. I turned my eyes back to my newspaper, studied the headlines. The Batlish hearings. The Pacers win a close one. Wilmington joins Syracuse and Detroit in bankruptcy. And what cities will be next? The food set out for breakfast is intended for use during the breakfast hour only. 
Oh, wait. Oh, I'm having flashbacks. Um, all right, so that's uh, William DeMeritt, one of our guests, uh, reading from Underground Airlines by uh, Ben Winters. So, um, Hillary, I want to just ask you, I, and I think this is something about which reasonable people may differ, in, but may differ. But I mean, we, for example, have clips here that we could play of, say, Jeremy Irons, but he's reading reading a Roald Dahl. I think it's James and James and the Giant Peach. He's reading a Roald Dahl thing, so. You know, I'd be fairly comfortable with that, um, a, a voice I know, a person I identify with any number of extremely creepy roles, uh, nonetheless, reading this book. But I feel as though sometimes I look at an audio book, and if it's an actor I really know, and it's material that I'm encountering in a very new way, I have a little bit of a discomfort level about that. Like, maybe I would rather hear somebody whose voice isn't famous to me. I don't know. Is there any kind of industry thinking about that or, or Hillary Urich thinking about that? Or Well, when, when I look at a famous voice that are attached to a book that I might be wanting to read, I usually try to listen to a sample. I try to dig it out a little bit, try to sample. It's usually about three minutes or so, maybe four minutes worth of the book. It's usually enough for me to tell if it's going to be something that I'm going to enjoy or if it's something that I'd rather pass on. But usually I haven't found an experience where it's detracted for me, honestly. Um, uh, I should say that actually uh, the new book that I'm listening to right now is that Michael Chabon book. It's Peter Rieger reading it. When I first noticed that, I thought, oh, crap. I mean, I love Peter Rieger and he's great and he's been on this show and stuff. But I thought that's going to get in the way. And it's been the opposite. He is just amazing reading it. He's a a terrific reader. So Tavia, has it reached the point now where people are buying audiobooks because you're reading them? Do you do you get that? Maybe I shouldn't ask you to brag in that way. But I assume just based <laughs> should, on the, based on the tweets we're getting, I think that that's probably the case. Well, it is the case, but I can understand that because there are audiobook narrators I adore who narrate work that I will always seek out. So I'm as much of an, a listening fan as I am a professional in this industry. And you do fall in love. There is a certain sort of intimate relationship that you have with your particular favorite narrator So you fall in love a little bit with them. They're telling a story intimately in your ear Mm. just for you alone. That's you can't help but fall in love with that person. So it's it's deep. It's like a gossling bonding with its goose. It's it's imprinting on you. Um, You know, uh, William, I'm also wondering what you learned this time around. I know that you've since then you've done some kids books and and you probably have a burgeoning career now uh, on on the way. What did you learn going in? Did you have to sort of figure this whole thing out as you went? Um, One thing. First audio book I ever listened to was Jeremy Irons reading Lolita. So funny you mentioned Jeremy Irons. (laughs) Well, see, that Um, would work. That would work at the level of of creepiness. Super, (laughs) super well. Um, It's funny. There was a lot of learning on the fly. Um, and like I said, Tommy, the producer on Underground, he he we was just a great fit. Like I super related to the material so intimately. I felt like uh, the main character, Victor, and I have sort of shared a lot in common for better or worse. And that that made the experience, I don't know, I hate to use the cliche word organic, but that was the case. Uh, when I was doing the children's books, the Wild One series by Alexander London, which is a lot of fun. Um there are like 35 different animal characters I had to do. Uh, and that was, and, and consistent, not guys that just like pop up, but they're like throughout the book. And I show up on the first day and the producer was like, so you've made um, audio file references that you can access, right? So you can find the voices. I was like, oh, uh, I sh- should do that on my iPhone next time. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but, you know, fortunately, that's why you have the sound engineer there so he can queue up. Oh, that's what the raccoon sounds like. And that's what the badger sounds like and the mole and so on. Um, so I'm learning that. And I have a specific way I like to go through the text, you know, with a with a pen or a marker or whatever to find cues. But, yeah, learn it on the fly. All right. On that technical note, we're going to have to stop. This has been such a great conversation uh, with Hillary Urich, uh, Tavia Gilbert, uh, and William Demerit. Also, thanks to Michelle Cobb. Thanks to Jonathan McNichol for planning this whole show out. Oh, Kate from West Hartford, I wanted you to tell the story about the bread truck uh, and the guy who took out audio books for his bread truck in the library. It should make a good children's book, actually. She quivered with excitement as he placed her on the bed. Ugh, I am not getting the essence of this scene. Who can I channel to interpret this intimate, sexually charged scene? She quivered with excitement as he placed her on the bed. Yes, nailed it. Gilbert Gottfried saves the day again.